This morning, we kind of stand at a strange intersection between our previous sermon series, which was entitled Habits of a Healthy Heart, and our sermon series for Lent, which is called Seeing or Believing in Resurrection in the Midst of Pain and Suffering. And today is Communion Sunday, As United Methodists, like many typical United Methodist traditions, we celebrate communion on the first Sunday of the month. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how communion, the sacrament of holy communion, is one of those places in which we encounter resurrection in the midst of pain and suffering. And how the sacrament of Holy Communion is one of those ways in which you and I are invited as many times as we partake to eat of this living bread that Christ has promised. The United Methodist understanding of Holy Communion describes it as this holy mystery. So I want to begin by asking you, In your own faith journeys, when have you experienced the mystery of God? When have you experienced the mystery of God? A moment when you knew that it was God at work. You could not explain in any other way the sequence of events that happened. And you knew that it was something beyond your doing. When have you experienced the mystery of God? When have you stood before God in God's holy presence and known beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is holy? Raise your hand if you can call to mind a time that that happened. A holy or mysterious experience of God. One of the things that is important in this faith journey of ours is that we can become so focused on the things that we need to do in order to grow in faith and lose sight of the fact that we are not following a program, but a person. We are following a living God who laid down his life in such a way that you and I would not only know, but that we would experience the love of Christ in a profound and personal way. If you have ever watched someone transition from this life to the next life, there is a holy, mysterious place in which God works. If you have ever been on your knees at the end of all that you knew and finally let go enough to let God hold you, you may have experienced this holy mystery of God. If you have ever been quiet long enough to hear voices other than those around you, you may have encountered the holy mystery of God. If you've ever worshipped, not with a song, but with a heart so poured out before God that you have let go of what has held you back and allowed yourself to be enveloped in the fragrance of God, you have felt the holy mystery of God. Did you know that that is what we are supposed to experience when we come to that communion table. When we come to the communion table, it is supposed to be a moment in which you and I experience the presence of God in a way that is unlike any other. A promise of God to be present in something as mundane as bread and juice. A promise of God to feed us mind, body, and spirit. The United Methodist Church, or the Wesleyan tradition of which we are a part, stands at a very strange place in the landscape of faith. And if you've been a part of Methodist community long enough, you've felt these tensions. The founder of Methodism was John Wesley, 
an Anglican or Episcopal priest. If you know anything about the Episcopal Church, it was the British version of the Roman Catholic Church. John Wesley was an Anglican priest until the day of his death, and he believed with all his soul that you and I should feed daily, if possible, on the sacrament of Holy Communion. Raise your hand if you knew that. I don't think we know this about our history. And yet, John Wesley was part of this deep, passionate, evangelical revival that pushed against church structure and liturgy that had become so rote and defined there was no movement in the hearts of the people. And so while in this Wesleyan tradition we have the richness of the preached word, the emphasis on the study of scripture and the habits or disciplines that lead us into a deeper relationship with Christ, we have this holy mystery a profound belief in the sacrament of Holy Communion. And I believe that as Methodists, as people of faith, we often lose sight of how the sacrament leads us to a deeper relationship with Christ. I want you to take out your sermon outlines for this morning. And we're going to take a moment and look at the results of your self-disclosure over the last couple of weeks. 116 persons at Epworth responded to the little green paper surveys or the online survey that we had. And keep in mind, these are habits or practices in faith that we believe will help you grow personally in your relationship with God. Have you invited a friend to church in the last year? Of the 116 of you at Epworth who responded, 44 of you said, yes, you've invited someone. This doesn't mean have they come. You've just invited. 56 of you said, no. I'm not at the place yet where I would invite somebody else to come to church. The practice of inviting and extending your faith to another actually builds the muscle of faith in such a way that God is at work. Have you engaged in daily study of the Bible or prayer? 71.6% of you said yes. 28.4% of you said no. That daily feeding on the word and the presence of God. Are you willing to share a story of personal change that could be shared with the larger congregation? 53% of you said, no, thank you. 46.6% of you said yes, even though you knew I couldn't ask you, so it made it safer to say yes, right? When asked if you were growing towards tithing, giving 10% of your annual earnings to God, 72% of you said yes, 27.8% said no. And when asked if you're serving in ministry at Epworth, 65% of you said yes, 34% said no. And if we were to ask about the sacrament, how many of you come intentionally to receive the body and blood of Christ, where would those figures be? I want to talk a little bit about what Holy Communion actually is. Jesus is the one who began this. It's part of why we understand it as a sacrament. And Jesus was gathered with his disciples right before Good Friday and Easter, and everybody in Jerusalem was celebrating what meal? Somebody tell me. Passover. And what is Passover? Tell me what happens in Passover. It's a Jewish holiday still celebrated today. Somebody give me a quick version. Angel of death or the Holy Spirit passed over the houses in Egypt of those that were marked with what? The blood of the lamb. And why were the Israelite people marking their door frames with blood? 
because they were told in a dream to mark their door frames with blood because the angel of death was sent by God because Moses was coming up against the Pharaoh. You've seen the Disney movie and Moses was saying, let my people go. And Pharaoh was resistant. Have you ever seen resistance to justice by institutions? And God will not be detained. And so God got to the point in which this angel of death was visiting even Pharaoh himself and the firstborn males of every home that was not marked with the blood of the lamb were found dead the next morning. But God saved the people of Israel. Have you been saved by the blood of the lamb? Is there a way in which Jesus Christ is for you, the sacrificial lamb that takes away the sin of the world? Jesus was gathered that Thursday evening before Good Friday and Easter. All of his disciples were present, and they were telling this story of God's goodness. Have you ever at your dinner table recounted the blessings of God in your life? Maybe you do it on Facebook. Maybe you do it on Instagram. The ways in which God has been at work in your family. And as the disciples told this story of the Passover, at the very end, Jesus said, we got a new thing to do. We have a new thing to do. While they were sitting and eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and blessed it and broke this bread and gave it to his disciples and said what? Take and eat. This is my body. Have you ever heard the expression skin in the game? Skin in the game. Don't talk to me unless you've got skin in the game. Don't come criticize unless you're willing to put skin in the game. Skin in the game means that we are willing to put ourselves on the line. God said, I will not only give you skin, I'll give you my whole self. This body broken for you and for me. The disciples were confused. This is not part of the Passover liturgy. The Passover story is about God moving in a community of people. It's not about a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. And Jesus keeps going. Then he takes a cup and he gives thanks to God and he gives it to them. And he says, what? Drink it, all of you. Not just some of you. Not just my favorite disciples. Not just the ones who aren't going to betray me or the ones who aren't going to neglect me or reject me. All of you drink it. For this is what? My blood of the covenant. What's a covenant? Covenant is a pact, a promise. Jesus is saying, this is my blood and this promise that I'm making, it's like bro blood brothers. It's like blood brothers. I am writing this love story in your life with my blood poured out for just you, for many, it says, for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What does that mean? When you and I get to our Father's kingdom, what are we going to be doing? Cody, what are we going to be doing? You raise your hand. We're going to be having communion, and Cody's going to be at the head of the table, if anybody wants to know. Jesus says, this is what we're going to do together. All tribes, all tongues, all nations gathered together, and we are going to break bread together. We are going to celebrate the blood of the lamb that has been sacrificed for us. So my question for us is, do we know what we do when we come to this table? We pay attention to what God is offering. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, it's in your sermon outline, says the first reason why it is the duty of every Christian to take communion is because it is a plain command of Christ. That this is his command appears from the text, do this in remembrance of me by which as the apostles were obliged to bless and break and give the bread to all who joined with them in those holy things, so were all Christians obliged to receive those signs of Christ's body and blood. Here, therefore, the bread and wine are commanded to be received 
in the remembrance of Christ's death to the end of the world. Observe, too, that this command was given by our Lord when he was just laying down his life for our sakes. They are therefore, as it were, his dying words to his followers. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The second thing I want us to consider in these habits of healthy hearts that allow us to see resurrection in death is that communion is a means to strengthen us for the journey. Raise your hand if you have ever been ready to give up on this little faith journey that God's walking you through. Like, I'm done, Lord. Only Paul and I, we're the only one, and, and, and Bella. None of the rest of you want to give up. Well, for those of you who have come to a place where you have felt weary, Jesus seems to speak very clearly about what only Christ can give. In John 6, he says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread. Just like when he sat with that Samaritan woman at the well and said, I know a water that you'll never thirst for again. Water that's like a spring that wells up within you. I am living bread. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. As Methodists, we believe that when we come to this table, there is an extraordinary way that God is present. We do not believe that it is just a symbol. We believe that it is a sacrament, meaning that God is present in a unique way. And when we partake, we are part of this promise of God that God will give us strength for the journey. And how many times do we avoid or move away? John Wesley says the grace of God given herein confirms to us the pardon of our sins by enabling us to leave them. Do you ever consider when you come to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion that you are receiving forgiveness? That you are receiving forgiveness, not generally, but you in the very place that you most need it. And my question is, how many times do we receive this sacrament and get back up off our knees or walk back down the aisle and carry our sin with us? How many of you have struggled to forgive yourself? You carried your sin to the altar and you carried it right back to your seat. Why do we do that? Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Do you remember that Jesus, as he was with his disciples ministering, declared to someone that he was forgiving their sin, and the Jewish leadership rose up against him, and they were outraged. Why? Nobody forgives sin but God alone. And yet we go to the altar and refuse to receive the gift that God has given. Jesus bled and died that you and I would not theoretically be forgiven, but that when we come before him, whether it's on our knees receiving the sacrament, whether it's in your bedroom in a prayer where you pour your heart out, whether it's with a friend who's holding your hand lest you fall down and stay there, Jesus offers forgiveness. All we need to do is receive. And the sacrament of Holy Communion is a way in which we are regularly reminded of the pardon of our sins, enabling us to leave them, John Wesley says. As our bodies are strengthened by the bread and wine, so are our souls. By these tokens of the body and blood of Christ, this is the food of our souls that gives strength to perform our duty and leads us on to perfection. If therefore we have any regard for the plain command of Christ, if we desire the pardon of our sins, if we wish for strength to believe, to love and obey God, then we should neglect no opportunity to receive the Lord's Supper. 
John Wesley came from a tradition in which the sacrament was served daily. Does anybody know how the Methodists came to the place where we serve communion once a month? Anybody know? Circuit riders. So Methodism, I told you, stands in that strange place between the Anglican, Roman Catholic understanding of sacraments and Holy Communion at every service and an evangelical understanding and emphasis on the preached word and the personal prayer with God. And in the middle of that place, Methodists said, we need the clergy. This is why I'm wearing my robe today as a symbol of this, right? Not just because people are like, Pastor Jen, you forgot to take off your robe. Like, yeah, I got it. I know. I'm wearing it. <laughs> right? So in the Methodist tradition, pastors or priests or clergy are those who administer the sacrament, not because my hands or my life are any more clean than yours, but because it is a way of reminding us that there is a sacredness to this holy mystery that comes from God alone. And when we come to receive it, we are promised communion with Christ. In the early days of Methodism, the lay folk preached three Sundays a month, and one Sunday a month, the circuit-riding pastor showed up to administer the sacrament of communion. What if we turned it all upside down? What if we sought this sacrament on a much more frequent basis? What if we believed that beyond the words that come from the pastor's mouth or even the times that we read scripture, what if we believed that there was a holy mystery in communing with God? And if we so did, would our hearts be yielded in a way that they never have to the work of Jesus Christ? I will tell you in this church, it is particularly the African community that has taught me over the last 10 years the power of sacrament and the power of yielding before God in that place. I have one more point with regards to communion, and that is that communion is communal. If you've ever taken communion on your own, it doesn't tend to feel the same way. It is intended to be a connection, a communion with God, but also a communion with the body of Christ. As broken and crazy as everybody in this space is, it is intended to be done together. The mystics have suggested to us that the way to find God is to separate ourselves, go out into the desert and pray that God would appear. There's moments I'm out in the desert, believe me. I'm done with the whole world. But God always says, come back. Because if you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and if you're going to love your neighbor as yourself, you have to commune with the body of Christ that is around you. Discipleship in the Wesleyan tradition is necessarily communal. It requires Christians seeking to grow in holiness of heart and life together. Through regular gathering for worship in small groups to watch over each other in love through mutual support and accountability. The Wesleyan way requires Christians working with one another in settings where they can see, hear, smell, touch, and embrace each other. John Wesley says, so widely distant is the manner of building up souls in Christ taught by St. Paul from that of the mystics, nor do they differ as to the foundation or the manner of the building thereon more than they do with regard to the superstructure. For the religion of these offers would edify us in solitary religion. Have you ever wanted to just go love Jesus by yourself and leave the world alone? Go ahead, tell me. I am done with church. I'm done with church people. I am done with this process. I'm going off alone. How long did God let you stay there? Two and a half years, Pastor Tammy says. All right, you can take a two and a half year sabbatical like Pastor Tammy did, and then he'll call you right back. It wasn't pretty. Directly opposite to this is the gospel of Christ, Wesley says. Solitary religion is not found there. 
The gospel of Christ knows no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Faith working by love is the length, breadth, depth, and height of Christian perfection. When you come to this table, there is one body, there is one loaf, and it is broken. And what broke Christ's body? What caused it to be broken on the cross? Sin. The brokenness between us is our own stuff to own. And there's a thousand little pieces right here in this place. You're broken within yourself and you're broken from those around you. And yet when we come to this place by the holy mystery of God, we become one. One by the power of Christ that makes us whole. The foot of the cross, there is no Jew nor Greek, it says in Romans. There is no slave, no free. There is no man, no woman. There is only those who yield to the power of Jesus Christ. The resurrection in the death of Jesus Christ is your and my invitation to yield daily to a Savior who gives us his body for the forgiveness of our sins. And as you come today, we're going to take communion differently today. We're going to take it at the rail. So you're going to come forward and you're going to kneel at the rail and Pastor Tammy and I are going to serve you a piece of bread on either side. And as you do that, I invite you to feel what it feels like to yield before your God. And I invite you to leave your sin and your unforgiveness there, that you would claim the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, remembered through the sacrament of Holy Communion.